was a very, very small set of clips at, at the end of a Disney Plus promo that were Percy Jackson related. Um, and they seem to be from two particular scenes, one of which is Clarice and Percy fighting on the beach when I'm guessing right after she saves them from the Hydra. Um, and in that clip in the background, I had made a post on this on my page that you can see one soldier behind Clarice's so shoulder that like, um, it appears to not necessarily strictly be a Confederate soldier. The hat particular doesn't look like that time period. And um, when I asked my brother, his first instinct was World War I, though he was like, it could potentially still be a Confederate. Maybe they just got the costume wrong. Um, and then on the picture with Percy, there is what appears to be a Viking behind him. So we think that in lieu of an entirely Confederate crew, they might be going with different eras, just different eras of fallen soldiers. Mm -hmm. I will say to support that, um, the first soldier that you showed me in a screenshot that your brother said was from like World War One. Um, <laughs> if anyone's ever watched any of the Marvel movies, mm -hmm. um, that he looks like Bucky. Yeah. Like I remember Bucky because you see him in like his World War One garb in the first um captain america movie when he's going off to war um so that's like world war ii i guess but it's still like it kind of overlaps <laughs> and so i was like yeah that does actually look like him um from like the 1930s and so either way i love that idea <laughs> yeah i i i like think i think that it would be really funny to have all of them like speak different languages <laughs> and be like just from like completely different times in history and have and be like arguing <laughs> all the time with each other about like no we should do it this way no we should do it that way and yeah. we're whatever and Clarice just sitting there like why is this my life <laughs> yeah like it would definitely, I mean, even if they're from the same country, but different time periods, how they operate as a military unit could be very, very different. And so there would probably be a lot of fights about like, oh, I'm the highest ranking after Clarice, and so you have to listen to me kind of stuff. Um, that would probably be a very easy in for comedy of like, who is the most qualified? Where does the hierarchy structure fall? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I so a lot of people in my comment section were still okay with Clarice having a Confederate army. And it's definitely tricky because Dior's half black, Leah, I believe, is full black, and they particularly don't like Leah. I mean, we we do get the sense I'm remembering that like um they're begrudgingly following Clarice's orders for sure, but they they only openly dislike Annabeth yeah so that could be like is it really just because she's a yankee yankees fan like i don't think that's it yeah and it's also a thing of like i get the idea because we've we've talked about we talked about this when we read sea of monsters mm -hmm. like i get the idea of liking the idea of confederate soldiers having to listen to a black person and do what they say mm -hmm. also a thing of like most of the time when black people have roles in movies and tv and stuff it has to do with slavery uh -huh. most of the time when black people win oscars it's because they're playing a role that has somehow to do with slavery and it's like what if the show doesn't do that like like what if they just like don't make black people be reminded of that when they get reminded of that every single day of their lives <laughs> And yeah. instead, they just, like, get to enjoy this for what it is. Like, they don't need that. And they can just, they can do the same story, like, the same general idea. It's just that Clarice is stuck with people that don't want to listen to her and are from, like, an old battle where they lost. And, like, there's lots of battles through history where people lost. Yeah. It doesn't have to be from that one. Like, they picked that 
in or Rick picked that originally because everyone was white in the original books and it was like an American battle and every and his whole story is about you know all the mythology people being American centric now that we're the center of Western society and so like that's why he picked it but it doesn't have to be like that now especially when actors are playing that stuff out I can only imagine that, that would make them feel really uncomfortable yeah and it's not that necessary to the plot they're really in so little of it considering i'm pretty sure they just kind of disappear after they get to the island so they, they all blow up yeah they, they all blow up when the ship blows up and that's it so they're only there for a couple of scenes anyway they are really horrible to tyson and make him scared and that's basically their role Mm-hmm. And maybe the show will get, will show more of them and what Clarice is dealing with and things like that. Um, but at least for like the book, that's all they're there for. And that's not necessary. Yeah. Yeah, so that was like an interesting thing to pick up on. The other scene was the chariot scene. And we see the front of two of the chariots. It's kind of hard to tell who's next to Percy. Um, on Twitter, most people were speculating Clarice, um, although in the books you mentioned it's Charles Beckendorf. Mm-hmm. Um, so it could be either. You can't tell because everybody's in armor, but you can clearly tell which one's the Poseidon one, at least, because it has a trident on it. And Tyson's in it. <laughs> yeah. It's the only, it's the other one only, you can only see one person. Um, and I, I, I'm assuming that it's Clarice just because they're very obviously like showing that dynamic that that Clarice and Percy have in that book Mm -hmm. and especially because we know that after the chariot race is when uh what's his face I forget his name in this moment decides just decides that Clarice won, <laughs> even though she, uh, you know, didn't. She just happened to survive because because Percy and Annabeth went off to like stop the birds that were attacking them, <laughs> yeah. and so she just won by default because the other people ran off in the middle of the battle to go save everybody. But since they're like setting that up, it feels like it probably is probably going to be her mm-hmm. especially because of the fight that they have yeah like later and everything that and it makes sense why this why these fights would happen um but it's just i feel like that's like the consistent story that they're telling is is clarice and percy uh going at it <laughs> Yeah, and I feel like that's going to make the ending so much more powerful, too, where he's like, here, you take the fleece back because she's not going to be expecting it at all, of course. Yeah, and, like, the the other thing from that little clips of the only, like, voiceover thing we got is Percy saying, like, everything in this world has suddenly changed. Everything is different. Mm-hmm. And he sounds, like, upset when he's saying it. And it's like, yeah, that's... When we were reading Sea of Monsters, I was like, yeah, it is kind of overwhelming in this book how he comes back here and literally every single thing about this place that he loved is different. Everyone's treating him differently. Everyone's treating, like, Annabeth is being not nice to him because of Tyson. Kids at camp don't want to listen to him. Like, everything is more stressful. Um, And Clarice is kind of a way to show that because of how like she's going on this quest that everyone knows she shouldn't go on um that it's not a good idea for her to go on it but she's going on it anyway and going on it alone yeah and going on it alone and and like leaving everyone at camp when everyone's scared and um and is just doesn't want to admit that she can't handle it because she feels like she can't and and so yeah if i was if i was percy in in those circumstances especially because right when she shows up is like after they get away from luke and after the whole hydra thing yeah he tries to ask annabeth like why do you hate my my brother he hasn't even like why do you hate my brother so much and she doesn't really give him an answer um it's like 
I, yeah, at a certain point, you're like, you know what? Fine. <laughs> like, let's fight. You're going to show up here when we're on this island by ourselves and wake us up in the middle of the night or whatever. How from like the, the scene that we saw them film, it looks yeah. like him and Tyson were sleeping and then they show up and scare Tyson and then which is already bad enough for percy <laughs> that yeah. somebody is scaring tyson and and another person is being mean to him and then she shows up and immediately is just like let's fight and it's just like sure <laughs> like sure wow. let's fight why why not fight sounds like a great time for everybody the thing we know for sure now at this point is that there's going to be flashbacks of young annabeth luke and talia um, which is something we had predicted before the casting came out. We said that would be a, a reason to announce Talia sooner rather than later is if they're doing a bunch of flashback scenes. Um, yeah, which is also interesting considering book wise, we're, we've read three books again for this podcast and there's barely any. Like we of course know because of CM Monsters and Annabeth's unfolding relationship with Tyson that something happened that had to do with the Cyclops. And um, I think she, that's where she even reveals like, yeah, it was mimic, mimicking people's voices, like my dad's voice and stuff. And that's why I ran to it. Um, and that freaks her out, especially when Tyson does that. Um, so yeah, it's like, we, we barely have that as readers at this point, but we're gonna get it much earlier with the show. Mm -hmm. And it, with the show, there just isn't a reason that they have to wait on those sort of things. It's yeah. the whole thing of it being like a visual medium versus like books. Like um, uh, someone who I talked to about Percy stuff was talking about how in the photo of um, of Athena and Annabeth that Athena has like her thing, her I don't know what to call it. Her like sword thing. Oh, oh yeah. And, and she's like, oh, I wonder why she has that. And I'm like, it might purely just be to make it more recognizable that she's Athena. Mm -hmm. On it because it's a show and they want to make it as easy as possible, especially because this is a show meant for like kids. Yeah. They want little kids to be able to watch this show and know that that's Athena without having to like sit there and spoon feed explain to you like I am Athena god of bubble like that's this show doesn't do that they didn't have any of the other gods do weird speeches like that that can happen on kid centric things um mm -hmm. so it could purely be just something like that and that's kind of what this show does um in a good way I think yeah let's see um we could probably do a montage of all the casting reveals that they've done since then, but I can't even remember. We we know Tantalus, we know the the Grey sisters that are driving the cab, we know Talia, we now have Athena. I think that's it for the new cast this time. Mm -hmm. the, they haven't, they yeah, haven't I, said, like, who is Cersei yet, or... Polythemus or or um the new person Allison or any or anyone else like any of the other gods that might show up um this season um like they had nobody expected Hermes to be cast until they announced that Lynn Manuel Miranda was playing him in season one okay. and so it's one of those things like it's always possible that they'll surprise us with somebody that they cast earlier than we expect them to um but at least at this point they haven't and they don't have to like they're they're probably around like episode probably like around episode four or something like that um mm -hmm. they've been filming since august so that's like three and a half months of filming about halfway so that's about where they would be and so a lot of like the guest people besides Thalia hasn't they haven't like really shown up yet and yeah, so people are going to be like one episode tops yeah and so when they get to the episodes with like Polythemus and um and Cersei and anyone else I can't think of right now 
they'll announce those then but i like that they do that they don't give everything away at once it's more fun to get little bits at a time as as things go along yeah i like that anyway because because it, it makes it more fun <laughs> Yeah, the thing is, we did at least expect a longer trailer coming from D23, but the little snippets we got at least gave us two very crucial scenes. And I, I will say that I would be very surprised if there isn't a longer trailer before, by the time the holiday season is over. Mm -hmm. And because usually Disney would want to put something out, especially about a kid's show like this, um, especially because it's coming out next year yeah um that they'll want they'll do that and i would i'm just just i have no reason to think this <laughs> but i'm just assuming just based on how they do stuff for season one and stuff that they'll probably say when it's coming out next year even if they don't have like an exact date it'll probably be like whatever summer fall whatever like how they did that in um with the first trailer last time and although last time it was a little different because the writer, the everything strike yes. <laughs> happened, which made them, which made which it not come out until December. Um, this time there is no strikes happening. So it will be, it will be much easier for them to finish much quicker. Yeah. Still no like season three announcement yet though. I'm like, so <laughs> waiting for them to lock it in. The sooner the better. I just don't want to be like worried about that. <laughs> I know, especially because season three is like everybody's like magnum opus season, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> including the cast. <laughs> They're already so talking good. about Titan's Curse since they stopped filming season one, and so um, I do think that, like, I guess to give everybody like some perspective, because I know we just want it to happen so bad mm -hmm. that we don't want we don't want to have to wait. But I will say that. When it comes to especially how um, studios have been lately with canceling things and or just like taking a long time to like renew shows and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that a year after season one finished airing, they'll already be finished filming season two and we'll be starting to do like the post production stuff and it will be filming later on next year. Mm -hmm. it's really fast <laughs> um that's that's it's really fast for them to for there only to be like four months after the show stopped airing basically before they started like giving the cast scripts and working with them again and then filming and so they're obviously know that the show did really well um they had the cast do like a live stream because it's like gigantic in brazil Mm -hmm. And that's the whole reason why they even did something like that for D23 in Brazil. And so it's obviously doing really well. And Disney likes that. They like a kids focused thing. And so I don't, as long as it does fine, I don't think that there's ever going to be a problem with this show necessarily of it continuing mm -hmm. unless something crazy happens. But I don't think even that necessarily will it would be surprising if they suddenly like change course when it comes to that um yeah. because it is like a children's type show a lot of ages watch it and they can clearly see that there's a built-in fan base for it that's willing to watch when um like the other fan bases they have like marvel and star wars are like all over the place um this one is not like that like people we don't harass like the actors in the same way that they do on in marvel or star wars so it would be easier for them to to have this continue yeah i mean like i i have to wonder with like the book band stuff just to tie that mm -hmm. into i would hope i feel like they're not as big on censoring media especially because technically percy jackson in the olympians the series is behind a paywall so it's not as accessible as something like public books but um i think we should also touch on that again just because there were a lot of people that found us on youtube via <laughs> the book band stuff yeah. um so well, i kind of just yeah one, one thing i wanted to say before we even start that is there was is an animated show um 
Now I can't remember the name of it. Oh, yeah, I wrote it down. This was the one that Becky pointed out, right? Mm -hmm. Boom Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Never heard of it before this either. Yeah, so it's an animated show that I'm pretty sure is on the Disney Channel. And it's mm -hmm. a very, like, inclusive show. Like, the main characters are all, like, people of color. And they completed an episode where the villain in the episode is a transphobic woman who is saying that a trans girl that's on the volleyball team shouldn't be allowed to play sports and it's basically an entire episode where that person is just harassing all the kids on the show and the animators for the show went on twitter and said that disney said that they're not going to show the episode because of what happened with the election and mm -hmm. then you know deleted their tweets when i'm sure disney told them to delete them um yeah. but so like people wouldn't have even known that this was even happening until unless those people said something because they were obviously really angry and becky was commenting on it to say that she's watching what happens with this very closely because mm -hmm. her and rick would not be okay with censorship and they know what their show is and yeah. that, they would never allow like there's somebody that i would be shocked if they allowed disney to ever censor their show at all especially now that they have creative control yeah. um when they didn't when the movies were happening they would fight like so hard about that because they've mentioned a million times about how they know how many people are affected or like care about these books around the world like we talked about how rick made a statement on palestine and the whole reason he made that statement is because he gets letters from kids in palestine and he gets letters from kids in israel mm -hmm. and he felt like he needed to say something and so even in like there's so many people around the world that are affected by what happens with these books that they can't just like sit back and be like oh i'm sure everything will be fine yeah <laughs> and there are people that would like use their their place like the power that they have to try to make things as good as they possibly can i get i'm like trying to think of how to phrase this but the thing i've just this like we're going to talk about the book banning thing in a second but before we even talk about that i wanted to talk about that in the context of just this show mm -hmm. um that one of the things that's complicated about Trump winning is before he won this show having a very diverse cast and not only a diverse cast but also a diverse like crew who works on set um there's a non-binary like black person that is a, in the writer's room um and he's not the only black person that is in the writer's room of this show which is usually there's usually only one mm -hmm. and but there isn't with this show and so it's it's a very diverse organization i guess overall on in every level and before he was elected it was this great thing and it's it obviously still is but now that he's elected they're also kind of in danger <laughs> and like i don't mean to sound like over dramatic because it's it's honestly not but though <sighs> It always goes like this where whenever non-white people are cast in like a big role it's always a bigger deal because they're it, they're like a, a symbol um, outside of themselves like leah being annabeth is a big deal for like black people in general if something bad happens with this role it'll be harder for black girls to get roles like this going forward and it's it's she's like not only playing this role but she's also like representing her entire community mm -hmm. um but with trump winning that's true for literally everyone on this show even the white actors like walker it's especially true for him now because yeah. this show is everything that trump hates this show is everything that people who vote who voted for him and the people who are going to try to litigate things going forward they hate this they hate everything about this show the entire like purpose of percy jackson the entire storyline of it the cast they hate every single thing about it and it's it like 
weirdly has especially because it's a children focused show is tr it it's like become like this weird symbol of everything that they don't like and whenever that happens they tend to go after them like <sighs> i talked about this on my on my tiktok but when when trump was president the last time was when the star wars movies were coming out mm -hmm. and um this weird thing happened where alt-right people who did not know anything about star wars pretended like they liked star wars and then pretended like they were outraged at the new star wars movie for having a woman lead and like two men of color as the other like main stars of that trilogy and like i know that there are alt-right people who like star wars that's obviously true but these people did not know like there there were people i interacted with on twitter that did not know that luke and leia were brother and sister they did not know that tatooine is the planet that like luke comes from mm -hmm. like just it'd be like if you were talking to somebody who said that they loved percy jackson and hated this show but didn't know what camp half-blood was or didn't know that percy grew up in new york city it was like that sort of thing of like you're obviously lying about how much you like this thing and so why are you talking about it so much and it's because it be it was the same sort of thing it happened in the way that it did like the casting and everything happened before trump was elected the first movie came out at the end of 2015 and then all of a sudden those people were under way more scrutiny than they were before and went through a lot of horrible harassment through those when those movies were coming out because the alt-right basically community online especially on youtube use them as like basically like a talking point to try to get people on their side and to and they use it as like oh these people are ruining star wars they're like making star wars woke and things like that and and so this show is like kind of in this weird place like that where nobody is free from it like especially like they also harassed Daisy Ridley a lot and they're going to harass Walker for the same thing because it's almost like they feel like you're betraying them by mm -hmm. being white and being part of something like this and not only being a part of something like this, but being the star of it. And it like makes me very nervous to think about what could happen with them because they are literally children. Like at least when it comes to Star Wars, they were in like their early 20s when this all started. But yeah. at least they were like adults. These are like literal children. They're 15 years old at this point. And, and it's scary to think about what they could go through in the next few, four years. That has nothing to do with them. It has literally nothing, nothing at all to do with them. And I don't mean to like freak people out about it, but it's just part of this whole situation that's going to happen is and that's why people like Becky and Rick are like already watching things very closely because they want to be sure that they try to protect everyone that's involved in this thing that they created, that they decided to be made by Disney and protect them as much as they can. Because it's like this before this happened, this was really great. And now it's like, well, this is still really great. But now now what do we do? <laughs> Yeah, now it's a little scary that there's going to be, like, budding romance plot between Annabeth and Percy. Yeah, <laughs> especially because some of the stuff with Trump is that they are probably going to try to challenge interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, there's so many plot lines with these, with this, th like, the literal plot line of this thing is, is is to not like give in to not want to take like unilateral power and control to control everybody, but instead give that power and control and share it with your community. That is essentially what Percy does. He always puts his people, his community over his own like power that he has. He doesn't care about the power that he has outside of helping the people around him. Yeah. And that is a little antithesis of everything that they do and everything that they want. They would, they absolutely would hate this. And I guess we always talk about protecting child actors anyway, but I'm like, this is going to get so much more intense <laughs> over the next few years. And we're just going to like do what we can to like write it out. That's all you can really do. But I guess I just wanted to try to um, almost put something in beforehand to be like, if some people start saying like really aggressively that 
this show is like the worst show they've ever heard, but they also don't know anything uh, anything at all about it. Just know that uh, you're not going crazy. That this is why that happens. People like this is what people do. They use this stuff as a way to get people to join their team. And yeah. there are a lot of people that joined that stuff because of Star Wars and Marvel and things like that in the last few years. Don't be, don't, don't, don't listen to them. <laughs> exactly. We do not want to fall down that same pipeline. Mm -hmm. so kind of like steer us into the Project 2025 book ban. Um, so the list that was going around from what I saw wasn't necessarily an official list. It was more just these are books that have already been banned on this basis before in libraries and in schools because although it's not going to happen nationally like all at once and and things like that, it's starting to happen in more conservative areas where they're saying things with libraries like, oh, if parents find something to be questionable and not appropriate for minors, they can report it. They can potentially get a cash like reward for reporting it. And then the library gets fined. And so I forgot what the, the place was, but there's already like libraries saying that they're going to be adults only. So they don't have to worry about like, oh, is this too inappropriate for minors, even if it's just like regular, like middle grade or YA fiction. Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, the Heritage Foundation is uh, the horrible group that where all the people from Project 2025 who like wrote their like manifesto is what I call it because okay. it basically is a crazy manifesto. They're all from that foundation and they worked with the Moms for Liberty group the last however many years to try to get books banned at schools and things like that and just like cause chaos in okay. general like a lot of the worst stories you'll see is in the state of florida but i've heard stories of them doing that in like utah um i'm sure they're doing it even in the state that i live in i just don't know about it as much um because i don't have any kids that like go to school so i wouldn't hear about it as much but mm -hmm. they've been doing that for a few years like kind of setting the scene of like what they want and without sounding crazy like this is literally what they think they think that any book with any sort of like queer or like woke and i'm saying that with quotation marks woke ideas is like propaganda they think that anything with anyone queer in it is like porn and that and so the way that they literally put it is that if libraries and librarians and book and like any librarians because they're focused on schools so far would have that then it would be like they 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 think that those librarians should be charged as like people doing sex crimes yeah or giving children books yeah. <laughs> that have just non-white characters in them that and queer people existing in them not even queer people in relationships yeah and of course, like the big books that people knew that they've tried to ban or like have brought up like fully trying to ban from schools is Rick Riordan and also like Twilight and The Hunger Games and other books like that. All of those books are written by white authors. And so I know that they have gotten books banned by non white authors. Yeah, already and they would do it like if if they're doing it this much with these books, imagine what kind of stuff they're going to pull with authors that don't have that sort of like clout, I guess, in like a white supremacy world that aren't white, that aren't cis, it would be even worse for them. But it's also just a wild thing that that that's their priority, I guess, like, mm -hmm. so the thing that the only thing I can come up with of why I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. It makes me like a level of like anger that I don't feel that often mm -hmm. to think about how they're doing this because they say that they're trying to protect children. Yeah. And I'm like, you're not protecting children. 
I really would like you to stop acting like you are because you're not, you're putting children in more danger. Mm -hmm. Because (laughs) I've actually never so far talked to somebody who grew up in an abusive family that did not love the library. Yeah. Like we all go to the library. I like in bookstores, but just libraries. Let's start with just libraries because that's what they're focusing on right now is wanting to like arrest librarians as sex crime people for giving children books. And so like I I'm just remembering times when my this is not like an over exaggeration. My dad would come home from work and I would literally run like out of my house and like literally run like run away and there was a tiny little bookstore that was like a five minute run away from our house and there's also the library and i used to like literally run out of the house when he would come home because i would be so scared of what he would do to me when he came home that i would run to one of those places and just stay there for like an hour or a couple hours or so And the person who owned the bookstore would just let me sit there and like read whatever book for free when when like my parents were getting divorced and my dad was especially absolutely insane. um, My sister and I didn't want to be at home when he was there by ourselves like when just he was there when my mom had to work on the weekends at her grocery store job and so we would leave and go to the bookstore and just sit there for hours and hours on end or we would go to the library and just like read teen magazines or read books or whatever for hours and then you know go steal candy from my mom's grocery store when we like ran out of places to go and but because we couldn't go we literally could not go home and because it was that he was that dangerous and out of control then that like we did not, I did not know what would happen if we were at home. And so it's like, we can't be here. So let's just leave. And so like, if there is no library, where the fuck was I going to go? Like, where the hell was me and my like, me when I was 11 and 12 and my sister when she was nine and 10, where were we going to go? If the library was closed, if there was no bookstore, where there was nowhere for us to go. And like, where where are we gonna go? We lived in a small town where everything was like 15 minutes away driving. There was like a gas station. There's a couple gas stations, like a Walgreens yeah, and the awesome. grocery store that my mom worked at, but you can't stay at like businesses for hours on end, especially when you're a kid. And we didn't have any money to like buy things and you have to buy something to be in those places. So like, mm-hmm. what, where, what are abused kids supposed to do? Like we read these books. I used to write fan fiction about me being in real doll books inside my head as a way to like cope with what was going on in my life. And so like, how are we supposed to survive our childhood, which is already so difficult. It's so impossible to survive that to start with, but how are we supposed to survive it? If you take away like one of the only things we have that is safe to go to like my dad couldn't get mad at me if I said that I was at the library Mm -hmm. like that was one place where I could go to and I would still like leave when I was there earlier than I wanted to because I would be afraid that he would show up and start screaming at me and telling me to go home and but still like that was like one place I could we could go and so it's like where if you're going to take a library away from kids and you're going to take away books like Percy Jackson that teaches them that they're being abused and that it's wrong that they're being abused. Like, if you don't want kids to know that, why don't you want them to know that? And then also, if you don't want them to do that at a library, then figure out another place for us to go. Yeah. Like, do that first. But you're not going to do that first because you guys are the abusers. You want your kids to stay home and just have to live under your rule. You don't want them to have the freedom to actually decide who they are for themselves. You want to make them be who you want them to be. Mm -hmm. And it's just, so the, the stuff, at least specific to Percy Jackson, the reason why people have been talking about it more in general with the book banning like stuff is because of how severe the project 2025 stuff is about that, that they want to arrest librarians for sex crimes. 
Mm-hmm. And so any, literally almost any book that is out there would apply under their rule. And it's one of those things of because he is now president and he already has control of the Supreme Court from the last time he was president. Yeah. And they have control over the House of Representatives and they might have control over the, the Senate too. I honestly don't know, but they have control over so many things that it's actually possible for them to try to do these things. And it just makes you think about like, okay, if they ban books from all these libraries, then like if they, especially if they ban books from the library saying that they would charge you with like a crime, Mm -hmm. if you had those books and like gave them to a child or something, or just had the books at all, that you would be possibly charged with like a criminal crime, then it's it's hard for me to believe that like other places that sell books like Amazon that are like corporate run and like, like Trump, like asshole face, like tweeted the day of the election results, like congratulating Mm -hmm. Trump on winning Jeff Bezos is who I mean. He congratulated um, Trump on winning and obviously he would vote for Trump. And so a lot of like top corporate people would, And so it's hard to believe that if there was that sort of a threat that they wouldn't just start pulling that stuff from their websites. And like, yeah, there's going to be like independent people like bookstores that won't give in that easy, but it's more of just a scary thing to think about how that could be something that people even have to worry about. And, And it just especially makes me really angry because the people that are being affected the most are gen alpha who could not vote yes they had no part in this at all and it reminds me so much of when i was 15 was the 2000 election when george bush won they said that he won he didn't really win but what (laughs) that's a whole other subject (laughs) but he was named at least the president of that of that election i was so mad then that i couldn't vote against him because i already hated him and you know, the next year was when September 11th happened and then the Iraq war happened and all these things happened that destroyed like my generation, my, the year, the age that I am, our lives for up until now. And we're mm-hmm. still being affected by those decisions now. And so I hated the fact that when I was that age, that all these things happened in my life because of other people, other people decided to elect that guy and it ruined my life. And mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to just like, I don't want us to do what we people did back then with millennials and just kind of like hand waved it. And we're just like, oh, this is just how things are. And it's like, no, I don't want to do that with these kids. Like these kids haven't done anything. They've grown up in a world where they're told that they have to go to school. They're all, they also might be murdered at school and nobody cares. Like the last thing these kids need is for their freaking books to be taken away. Like out of everything that is happening to them, that is like the priority is that they can't read the books that they love anymore because somehow books are going to do something to them that being shot and killed at school won't. Yeah, and I mean, like the literacy rates already going down. People talk about this all the time when it comes to Gen Alpha because they had to do school from home one of the years so far. Mm-hmm. And it was not fun. I'll tell you, my kid like hated school from home. He was distracted all the time and he survived still being at, at grade level because I read with him every night. But mm-hmm. like some of the people who didn't have an environment at home that fostered, you know, reading, independent thinking, things like that really suffered in that year that they had to be at home with their parents. And yeah. If you think about just like the Percy Jackson kids, like Walker and Leah being the youngest ones, they were seven when Trump was elected in 2016. Yeah. And in 2020, when everything was shut down, they were 11. Mm-hmm. And so it's, I thought of that when I saw how young they were. And I was like, they were in like fifth grade when COVID happened and their school was interrupted for like, fifth and sixth grade and then after that was when they started doing Percy and so they've never really had like normal school necessarily since then anyway Mm -hmm. and it's just it's so weird to think about how 
their ages were the ones like the kids that had to go back to school and people were fighting over whether they had to wear masks and kids kept getting COVID because they kept trying to force them to go back to school and yeah and all that stuff was going on and it's just like they haven't had anything normal (laughs) at all and it's it's just so messed up that this has happened that's going to make it even worse like these kids don't don't deserve to worry about if they read a, their favorite book or their favorite book suddenly being gone yeah. one day because and it's purely just maniacal like megalomaniac people just pulling at any power they have they don't care and i think that's the thing about this that's the hardest is is they don't care like nobody involved with trump actually cares about what happens to kids yeah they don't at all if they did they wouldn't be doing any of this stuff they don't actually care they're just they say that they're trying to protect children because it's harder for people to argue against what they want to do if they say they're doing it to protect kids but that's why it makes me like literally like murderous when people say stuff like that and try to use like child sex abuse as like an out and it's like i have not given you permission to use my life as a way for you to be a horrible monster no you don't get to use my life and what happened to me as an excuse for you to be a horrible human being if you're going to be a horrible human being just own up to it and don't try to act like you're actually a nice person when we know you're not Mm -hmm. like you're the exact like person that looked the other way the entire time i was going through what i was when i was growing up i grew up in a very republican area like i used i just told a story about how i used to me and my sister used to hide out in a grocery store and a a local like gas station I would go to sometimes and also a local bookstore and everyone around us knew what was going on that something was wrong and nothing ever happened to my dad like my (laughs) my piano teacher that I had when I was like 11 and 12 used to drive by our house to make sure that we were still alive because they because that's how scary my dad was that she was worried that he was going to kill me and my sister and my mom and so she would drive by during the week to make sure that our cars were still there and we were still alive and and but and people in that town just like were like yeah everything's fine (laughs) and so it's like i know for a fact none of you actually care and i really wish that you would stop pretending and just like at least own up to like you just want to be a dictator mm-hmm. that's it Someone in my comments says matt gates cares about kids but that's a different issue <laughs> the side eye yeah he likes sex trafficking kids <laughs> yeah they're the exact people that we should be scared of meanwhile they're trying to divide us all by making trans people the enemy number one mm-hmm. and we've seen so i don't know like about your local elections we had to vote in california to make sure the wording was like just right on gay marriage in the state because i'm sure that that was preemptive of like let's preempt anything that's going to happen with trump and so like the fact that i had to vote again to protect gay marriage in my state is so crazy but it all comes back to like they started with trans people and i believe project 2025 might even say something about this like if you start with them that it's easier to divide up the rest of the queer community the lgbtq community and specifically separating out that t then you know like we could tackle everybody else later yeah, um, they've been yeah. doing that for a while that they know that if they can basically that trans people are the most marginalized part of the queer of the LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm. And so if they can try to convince us that trans people are not part of our community, and they can use them as a scapegoat, because they always have to have a group of people that seem scary. And that they because the whole way that people like Republican type people get elected is by scaring people and showing like a villain that they can go after and so trans people are the are the people that they're using for that the last however many years they just chose them 
And so they've been trying to separate them from the queer community and the queer community doesn't, so at least some people at least have noticed that and don't want them to, Yeah. Um, but they've tried to do that. And you can see that where the last few years around pride, there's always like some white gay dude that's like, oh, they're going to start going after the queer community soon. And then people are like, do not consider trans people in the queer community because they've been going after them since like 2017 or something like that. Um, but it's yeah. like, that's the obvious thing that they're doing to try to, they always pick like a more marginalized group that they think it would be safer for them to completely destroy them than the group as a whole. And I can only hope that people have enough information now to recognize when it's happening easier mm -hmm. and to at least try to make it as hard as possible for them to do this stuff because it's just it's so much like the like there's supposed to be a um there's supposed to be a book about nico and his boyfriend coming out next year and now i'm like i don't honestly don't know what's going to happen with that are they going to put it out anyway we'll see like with what they decide how far they get with things by then of mm -hmm. like what will happen but it's just a ridiculous thing to think about that this sort of stuff is all up in the air because this guy one but that's just how this stuff is going to be now yeah yeah um so the whole purpose behind it too what they they say the purpose behind it is is limiting or eliminating classroom discussions on race gender identity and sexuality because they feel there's an ideological bias in classrooms about those things yeah they like i said before they want to they want people to only think the way that they think mm -hmm. and so they want to take have total control over what is taught because they think that if they do that then everyone will just agree with them it's like it's a very simplistic way of thinking but it, i find that like really abusive people are like almost childlike sometimes by how simple they think things work and yeah. that the people behind project 2025 just think that if they don't let kids learn anything but what they tell them that everyone will just magically agree with them and that they will never have to worry about losing an another election ever again and that's literally what it is and it's like no that just makes people people still can tell that something is wrong there people if you try to shove something down people's throat and it's only the one thing that they hear, they will purposely not want to believe that just because it's the only thing that you're telling them to believe. Yeah. That's just how kids are. But especially like, there are always going to be kids that are going to be aware of that beyond even like, obviously black people and indigenous people and people in color in general, obviously are going to know that's not true. Mm -hmm. But it even like white people like me, growing up like i lived in an extremely white area there was literally no diversity at all i didn't talk to a black person until i went to college when i was 18 and but still like me growing up like i hated george bush so much that when i was 15 because i could tell he, how horrible he was and i just knew somehow i think it was from being abused like i was that i just knew that things were wrong and that this stuff was wrong like I remember seeing my church being protested when I was nine because we let gay people go to it. And it's just like that stuff stayed with me that I knew that that stuff was wrong. It would have been easier for me to believe that it was right because my dad was a horrible bigot and wanted me to think that way. I used to get in like screaming matches with him about that, about like every facet of that, about him being racist and homophobic and not liking religion in any way, shape or form. and literally everything you could possibly think of, I would end up screaming at him about it <laughs> from the time when I was like 12 or 13 or whatever. And so it would have been a lot easier on me if I just like agreed with those people because that's what a lot of people I went to school with thought. And I felt like I was losing my mind that I was one of the only people there that was like, this is wrong though. Like, obviously you can tell this is wrong, right? But like, nobody's admitting it. Why am I the only one saying this out loud? Yeah. And, and, but it was just, there's always going to be kids like that that can that just know that something is wrong and especially the abused ones mm -hmm. we're always going to know that it's wrong because we see through everything else and so 
it's just it's never going to work but they're going to try mm -hmm. and it's like they're not capable of just giving up the idea that they will never be able to control everybody it's yeah. just always a thought of like if i just like change things a little bit then we'll be successful and it's like it'll never work the way that you want it to but they will they're never going to admit that because that's all they want yeah yeah well and i wanted to give people some some things that i think that like we can kind of do as a fandom with percy jackson to preempt this um and or at least preempt it when it comes to our access to percy jackson because we did have a few people um in our youtube comments particularly that are like well shit, you know if i don't have libraries if i don't have schools i don't have these books anymore and um so some some ideas i came up with right now is i know in my family we're starting to ask about christmas lists put them on your christmas looks all the books like you want paper versions of the books just in case so that no digital access can be taken away like that um so put the paper copies on your christmas list if you are a child and um any gift cards and stuff should go to that if if that is a priority for you to continue reading those books um we have at least found a few different audio versions on youtube i know that i joked about the one that i was listening to because it got sillier as time <laughs> went on because the guy couldn't do any more voices so instead he gave everybody weird accents <laughs> like why is talia scottish <laughs> um, anyways um there are versions like that and i do know with audiobooks like the narrator is everything so um you might struggle along but those are out there um you even found like a a text version online when you were reading before you were able to get new paperback copies mm -hmm. i just literally googled sea of monsters pdf and a yep. pdf in a random library in england showed up so it's in england so mm -hmm. that one should be okay yeah yeah um so there are places online that have access to you know like copies and it doesn't seem like rick riordan is you know particularly big on going after them i don't know how much we can speak for disney because i know they're kind of the parent company behind it and they they do get rather litigious with stuff like that um but if if anything we talked about potentially doing our own live readings of um percy jackson which like we could do an hour of like reading and then commentary afterwards so that way if you only want to stick around for the book part you can stick around mm -hmm. for that part but um it would be nice to also kind of have it be a reading discussion group um because there were people who said that they like read the books in school and um yeah one of one of our cool. one of our comments that we got was somebody saying that they use the percy jackson books to teach kids english like at english schools where they're teaching the students english on top of teaching them like the the classes that they need to teach they would use percy jackson to teach those kids english while also teaching them about mythology at the same time mm -hmm. and so if schools wouldn't be allowed to use them anymore then those kids wouldn't have another easily accessible story like that for them to learn in a way that is easy for them to grasp and so it's like i do like the idea of us doing like a reading thing not only because it would be really relaxing yeah <laughs> you like just read it out like that and i i think everyone needs something to just like be able to relax during this time but it would also just be fun um and also just if you don't have access to the books at all still there at least be something of mm -hmm. them out there where you could like slowly follow along with us that can't get taken away because we have the books already they're not going to come into our house and like snatch them out of our hands <laughs> yeah so um that's something we're we're gonna talk a little bit more about doing and potentially get in the works um and i say if you are an actual adult and these books mean a lot to you read them to your kids doesn't matter how young the first time i read william the harry potter series 
which like, you know, of course we feel differently about Harry Potter these days was, I think he was one years old. And so I have a video of him barely talking, saying, I want to read Harry Potter and following <laughs> me around with a book. Um, but like, I made it a bedtime ritual to read to him for at least an hour every day since he was a little over a year and a half. And I've had so many teachers be like, you don't, you don't even know how few parents do this right now. Like, it's, it's kind of amazing that you guys have kept it up and kept it up this long because he still does it with me but he still is okay with me crawling into bed with him and reading with him for a little bit so um like read them to your kids your big kids your little kids and or if you're just a big sibling or an aunt or uncle right now like you can read it to them um that's another way to kind of pass it on to the next generation because um i mean what i try to say to william as much as it's a pain in my side sometimes is that um i'm not raising a dog i'm not looking for perfect obedience i'm looking for somebody who questions authority and that includes my authority over him and his dad's authority over him mm -hmm. um and giving them these tools like percy jackson is a hundred percent a kid who's not afraid to question authority no he problem. challenges so many gods and like he could get poofed away in an instant challenging these gods but he still does it mm -hmm. um and i will yeah. say to remind people too that if you have like littler kids there are um graphic novels mm -hmm. the, the graphic novel for house of hades just came out like in the last month and yeah. so that's almost all of the first that's book nine out of the first like 10 percy jackson books and so if your kids are little enough where you don't think they would stay focused when you're actually reading, you can show them that at least to start. And yeah. because that all of that stuff is out there for anyone to get still. Mm -hmm. And I guess we're just trying to give people options to like get ready for this in a way that feels like we have some sort of control over something when yeah. we when we don't really have control over much. <laughs> yeah um what we can control is if if at all possible try to get your guys's hands on copies of those paperback books and um read them give them to other kids pass them around um these are not something that we want to let actually be censored out of our society no um okay so um oh the, back to back the the last thing I wanted to mention before we go into like epic mm -hmm. is the whole Deadpool thing. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> God, so, yeah, you saw this first, so I'll let you tell it. Yeah, so um, a couple months ago, I can't remember when that happened. There was a story that came out right when the it ends with right before the ends with us movie came out when Deadpool came out that. There was this weird press release where Ryan Reynolds and Steve Levy, who directed that movie, mm -hmm. said that Walker was was supposed to be in it, but they didn't give let him be in it because he went through puberty, and that he and they told the story that like oh we called him at home and told him that he his voice changed too much and he got too tall so he can't be in the movie and I was like I hope that you made this up because this is a horrible idea like to imagine like huge Hollywood people doing something like that. Like I was like, I really hope that you guys just made this up and are just putting this out now because you're trying to get ahead of like bad press for the It Ends With Us premiere. Mm -hmm. and because they put that out like right, like the day before that premiere happened when they knew that people would be like, what's going on with Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds? And so this week, um, like Ryan Reynolds tweets out this thing that Walker posted on his social media that um, that he was in the movie that he did like a voiceover for like a deleted scene. Mm -hmm. And because the movie came out on like Disney Plus and stuff for people to watch, Ryan posted like the clip of like the deleted scene. And of course, Walker was like really excited about hearing his voice in like a Deadpool scene, even though it got cut from like the actual movie. But mm -hmm. when I saw that, I was like, so they they actually told him he wasn't allowed to be in this movie because of puberty. When they had it recorded and everything. They actually told him that because they because 
they wouldn't they wouldn't have had him do that voiceover thing if they thought that he was it was fine for him to be in the movie and i was just like this the words i said to her was like i want to jump off of a cliff right now to imagine that they that ryan reynolds like called up this like 14 year old kid who like worships him and was like hey you can't be in the movie because of puberty but you can be in this voiceover part and of course he did it and then they ended up cutting the the scene from the movie anyway and the only thing i can say out of this whole thing is like walker's the star of the show on on disney and this is the way that they're treating him so that is interesting to think about what people who aren't like him are treated like by hollywood mm -hmm. and then the other thing is i i just i don't even know how to like put that it's just i'm glad that he's happy about it but at the same time i'm like this is a horrible way to treat like a an actor who actually knows you and was like in a movie with you the only thing i could think of was like i hope that they told him that the scene was cut before he went to the premiere yeah because sometimes they don't and like you hear stories about how people realize that their scenes got cut while they're at the premiere watching the movie and they realize that it's not in it mm -hmm. and so that was the only thing i could think of was like i really hope that they told him before he was actually there that he wasn't actually in this movie like i sincerely hope that he didn't show up to that premiere thinking he was going to be in a deadpool movie and then found like out while he was there that he wasn't i feel like he would have showed up with more than just Aryan if had he not known you know what i mean like the fact that he only came with one friend feels very low-key for well, all of in this he came with his dad and it, so it was him and his dad that were there but it was like when they were starting to film Percy Jackson stuff. So he took time away to go to that premiere. And yeah, it was just like a weird experience anyway, because he said that he didn't get to talk to any of them when they were there because they were too like, you know, hounded by people, which is understandable. But it just was like, I already, I was like, this doesn't sound that nice. <laughs> and then all this other stuff has happened. So I was just like, I really wish that I didn't know for sure that that actually happened because that's just a terrible way to treat a kid. It is. Don't do that. Don't call up child actors and tell them that they don't get things purely because of their body. Yeah. I feel like that should be obvious, but I'm just going to say it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I I still maintain just because there were so many freaking Deadpool variants in that scene. There was there was no reason why one of them couldn't have been Walker. You know what I mean? Like one of, what is his what is his name? The guy who plays Tom Holland. His mm -hmm. brother was in that was in that scene, and his brother is ten years older than Walker. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you could have had him in this movie. You just didn't want to didn't want to because you were nepo babying it up and giving it to tom holland's brother instead because he's tom holland and tom well, holland is a nice guy I like he's a child yeah and like tom holland is very like anti-hollywood stuff like he doesn't even lit he doesn't want to really be involved with it he only acts if he thinks it's actually worth his time mm -hmm. he was just in the news for like f fighting paparazzi to protect zendaya from paparazzi that were like right in her face screaming at her and stuff and so he's not someone that really plays by Hollywood rules. It was just like, this is obviously what you're doing. This is a Marvel person. You're in Marvel movies. So you're just giving it to them over a kid that actually knows you and really looks up to you. And that's just gross. Yeah. Ew. <laughs> yeah, it was a sad and disappointing way for that to get brought back up. It was just like, really? Like, I forgot about you, Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> or, well i wasn't looking out for you anymore it's more like it. i didn't forget but at the same time i was just like okay we're done with this situation moving on yeah yeah and then he brought it back up himself Damn it. <laughs> okay um anyway so for the second half of the pod today um we we're gonna talk about epic some more and we watched the next four animations that go with the next four songs um, so to catch people up, we had watched the Troy Saga last time, which ends on um, 
Warrior of the Mind, and then the next song after that was Polyphemus. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a few changes, and I'm going to try not to be one of those classicists with like, oh, they changed so much. Um, but some of the changes, I think, function well for the way the story is told because it is like such quick little like songs when you think about it. Three minutes is really not enough to tell the whole Polyphemus story. And I mean, technically the story spans the entire like 12 to 14 minutes or so of what we watched today. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I do feel like having the, the men go straight into Polyphemus's cave and shoot one of his sheep right away was definitely on par with what happens because I mean, the men do go in and help themselves to food. From what I remember, there was like a whole table laid out. It wasn't just his sheep. But um, what ended up happening, because of course Odysseus is just that lucky or unlucky, if you want to think about it that way, he ends up shooting the prized sheep first, <laughs> the the favorite sheep. So um, I, I think I've mentioned this before, at least on my own page, but when I was taught the Odyssey, I was taught it from a, a standpoint of like, of like, okay, but also think from Polyphemus's shoes, which like, there was the host mentality that was kind of ingrained into Greek culture, which was if somebody from, you know, like a foreign land comes up on your shore, you, you give them the best treatment, you give them your best like animals and your best food and all of that so that if you are to come to their land they give you that same treatment and so there was an assumption happening when um odysseus and his men went in which is that this culture likely exists in this this other place though we don't even know who these people are and so that's why they go in and help themselves it still comes off very entitled even with that culture because there's not a master of the house home saying like hey help yourself mm -hmm. um but that's why they thought they could get away with it and like apologize later, so to speak. Um, because I mean, the reality is they they were at war for 10 years and then they, they were on a ship. The supplies were limited, they were starving. Mm -hmm. um, so like they really thought they could just ask for forgiveness. Um, so with that, um, we have Polyphemus come and interrupt them right away. Um, he's very much portrayed from Odysseus's point of view. So very scary. The voice is kind of like, you can tell they layered like three or four voices over it to give it a very echoey kind of effect. Mm -hmm. And um, Polyphemus is right away just like, you know, that was hella rude. You killed my favorite sheep. Like now you're all gonna die. <laughs> um, and Odysseus is like, wait a second, wait a second, I can trade you, okay? You can have our finest treasure, which is our best wine. And like, of course that comes off as double insulting because it's like, you think that's a fair trade for bursting into my house and taking my prized sheep? <laughs> um, yeah, so Polyphemus replies, okay, we could trade. The trade that you're going for though is not, you know, for you guys to live. It's that you'll be eaten last. <laughs> yeah, which um, that is part of what Polyphemus says to Odysseus in the actual Odyssey is like, you know, now you get to watch me be eaten last. Um, let's see. Um, another thing too, like narratively, they put Polyphemus on the same island as the Lotus Eaters, which is not my understanding. Um, I'm pretty sure that the Lotus Eaters were further away than Polyphemus was, like Polyphemus was probably closer to Ithaca. Um, but um, narratively, like they have that happen so that it's immediately after the Lotus Eaters. And it makes them question like, why are none of these people eating any of this food or touching this flock over here? And it gets answered right away with, oh, cause there's a giant Cyclops here because it's his food yes i'm just like i'm picturing like if that'd be like when i had my cats if somebody <laughs> broke into my house and killed my cat and then was like here 
have a bottle of Diet Mountain Dew, because I know this is what you like to drink all the time, that will be payment for me killing your cat. I would have like punched them in the throat, <laughs> but like, yeah. no, that's not good enough. You killed my cat. <laughs> Give me much more than that. Yeah. So, um, let's see. Um, so the next song is survive where we see that the men's recourse, once they, they figure out they're not going to make it out of there alive is to attack and this does not happen in the odyssey this is the one time i'll be pedantic um because odysseus was thinking ahead because he was very much thinking like so in this version there they skip the whole there's like a boulder that's used as a door in the cave and that is too heavy for the men to move even if they're using all of the men that are there so they just go straight to attacking polyphemus because this door situation doesn't exist yet and um at least there's some strategy to the attack so what odysseus tells them is like let's tire him out let's go for his ankles because of course he's giant um but then all of a sudden one of them gets taken down and they're like oh no he has a club which like that also was kind of a question mark for me because it's his house why wouldn't he have like some sort of weapon or something to defend himself and his cattle with in there mm -hmm. um so yeah it was like a little weird that the club was unexpected to me um and then it seems like they just kind of stopped fighting out of nowhere which you know that's another thing that narratively kind of is a question mark because it's like why would he stop at just you know like a few of them if if they were truly attacking him. I, I, you know, there's a lot that you have to kind of try to make sense to with changing that. Um, there's a lot more abject horror to, you know, just is having to watch his men get eaten two at a time um, mm -hmm. and having to try to figure out what his next move is ideally before two more are taken, but it happens, I wanna say at least three times while he's in the cave that Oh, that Polyphemus is eating them two at a time. So, um, I feel like yeah. this is one of those times where they were, tr it's like telling the myth, but like telling like the somewhat nicer version of it, mm -hmm. because you don't want to write a song in a musical where people listen to like a bunch of people just get slaughtered. <laughs> And so instead you write that some of them get slaughtered and it's sad, but some of them are able to get away. When most of the time if that happened, they all would have just been dead. Well, yeah, I guess that with attacking them, all of them would have been dead. But if they had gone with the original, the eating them two at a time, I guess that could also be kind of horrifying to play out musically too. Yeah, because it's like, which two? is being taken every time and like which ones does he choose and the other ones having to sit there and wait when they know what's happening to the ones that are being killed at that time um i always think it's fun to like compare this stuff to percy stuff and i just think it's weird that this musical was nicer yeah to polythemus than a children's book series <laughs> Like, Poly they do get away from Polythemus, and they definitely, like, for lack of a better word, humanize him. Like, how, you know, Percy doesn't, the whole reason that they almost die many times when they're there is because Percy doesn't want to kill him because he reminds him of Tyson. Mm -hmm. And, like, Tyson literally has to convince him, no, you can kill him, it's fine. I won't be upset with you if you kill him because he's, he's, a, he's just a bad person. You, he's just a bad cyclops. You can kill him though, it's okay. But before that, he's like, I, I don't wanna do this because he's technically my brother. So they, they do that, but at the same time, they also don't pretend like Polythemus wouldn't have killed all of them if they didn't find a way to get away from him first. Like the dude is still trying to kill them when they're on a ship, like floating away, yeah. like from him and and things like that. And so I know that it's, I think it's part of the whole thing that this is, like uh, what they're calling like a TikTok musical, which is where the guy wrote it by and made it big by posting TikTok videos about him writing the songs. Mm -hmm. And so it's just interesting to see how 
he like toes that line of it reminds me in a weird way of like the stuff with like medusa on yeah. percy jackson where they they can't outright say like i was raped by poseidon because this is a children's show on disney plus um but i don't even know if they let people say stuff straight up like that even on adult shows at this point but but when you watch the scene you can know what if you know what the myth is you know what she's saying Mm -hmm. and like the actors at least knew like one of my favorite clips of all time that I ever found was Walker Scobell saying that his favorite Greek myth was the new Medusa myth. And yeah. I was like, you're my favorite little child actor after saying that, <laughs> that you like the version of her being a rape survivor. And so he was 13 when he filmed that and he knew at that point, that's what she was talking about. Somebody explained that to him so he would understand the context of that scene, even though they never say it out loud. And so that's what this kind of stuff reminds me of, of like knowing that Polythemus would have murdered all of these people and that they died in a horrible way. And Odysseus somehow found a way to get away from him, but all of these other men that he was like responsible for didn't. Mm -hmm. And he has to hold the responsibility of knowing that he was their leader and they were looking to him for help and he didn't really help them. Like, that sounds harsh, but, like, if you're, like, eaten to death by a cyclops and your, like, leader got away, even if you really like that leader, I'm not sure you're going to be so happy with their leadership skills. (laughs) Yeah, well, that kind of brings us into the next song, which is Remember Them, where he, that's when they start um, coming up with their actual plan, and so... Yeah, the fighting has seemingly just ended. Polyphemus is asleep and it's his body that's blocking the door. That's why they can't they can't outright just get rid of him. And so um, Odysseus says, we're gonna take his club, we're gonna sharpen it. And I want you guys to go for his eye. Um, and so the whole song has this undertone of like, what are we gonna do about the men he's already taken out because we can't take them out for burial. And he says, we remember them, which has to be extra painful. I mean, I know they don't go too much into the culture in this, but like knowing that the culture then was, if you don't have proper burial, you don't have your coins for care on, you're not crossing any of the underworld rivers. You're stuck Mm -hmm. in the like unburied limbo beginning part of the underworld. And so they're going to have to leave those people like that. And I'm sure there's some sort of ritual you could do when there's no body. But um, because they don't get eaten, like in traditional versions, there actually are bodies to worry about, which like, I didn't even think about that in the traditional version where they are eaten. Like, what do you do when somebody is completely consumed? Yeah, there's just nothing. Yeah. All you can really do is find something like ceremonial of theirs that you Mm -hmm. can like bury in place of like their actual body. yeah so i'm just thinking about some some a kid died at my middle school in a way like that where there wasn't a body because he died Mm -hmm. in a horrible plane crash and his his body was literally like sucked out of the plane oh my gosh (laughs) and so there like wasn't a body and they but they still had like a wake and a funeral and and like a casket and everything anyway um Mm -hmm. even though there wasn't anything in it and so they could do something like that but it is just a really I like this the song because it like hits on like the rage like mm-hmm. you feel when something horrible has happened to people that you care about and you know that you can't stop them and like the only thing you can think of of how to handle it is to just like try to keep going for them and also like almost like try to get revenge in their name mm-hmm. um, even if it doesn't feel like it's good enough that's the only thing you can really do at that point. Yeah. Um, so one thing that also, we kind of get the narrative reason of why Jorge put Polyphemus on the same island as the Lotus Eaters, which is, um, and I think this is also to not have to explain something cultural within the context of the Odyssey, is that Odysseus put Lotus into the wine he gave Polyphemus. 
and that's how he gets knocked out. The real reason he gets knocked out is because wine was made very very undiluted and very very strong and potent back in ancient greek times and so part of the ceremony of like an a party was you know someone would come up with a mixture of oh we're gonna add this much water to it to dilute it down and then we'll add this much honey to it and so it was always a different amount because you know whoever was like in charge would get to call out the amounts so you could have some ceremonies where you're using super potent wine and some where you're using very diluted wine. But he, he was giving Polyphemus the 100% undiluted stuff. So you have to think the alcohol proofing is much higher. Yeah. Yeah. I remember learning that somewhere that wine back in like ancient times was like super alcoholic. Yes. <laughs> and so it like literally just like knocked people out if they drank any at all. Well, yeah, and I mean, people think they're under a spell of Dionysus when they're drunk because it's that crazy of an experience. So, <laughs> but, like, they literally thought it was a religious experience. So, um, yeah, the Lotus kind of, you know, serves a function of we don't have to explain that too much. We He just has this sedative in his wine. Um, let's see. So the body was blocking the door, and they um, – so – Another thing they skip over from the original story, too, was after blinding Polyphemus, they escape by tying themselves under his sheep. And like that way, as he's feeling over the top, he's not he's he's letting only sheep go through, but he doesn't realize there's men underneath. And um, in this one, Odysseus and his men wait behind for the other Cyclopes to call out and be like, what's happening, you know, who hurt you? And he says the whole nobody part. Um, but then they just leave and, and Odysseus yells out, let's take the sheep with us. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, they leave with the sheep. And as they're leaving, Athena kind of taps Odysseus on the shoulder again. And is like, hey, so you probably need to get rid of him. Like, you can't just let him live. You're going to have to get rid of him. And um, that leads us into the last song we listened to, which was My Goodbye. And it's kind of a Athena Odysseus argument. She wants him to to take out Polyphemus completely. He's like, I, I've done enough for you. You know, like I went to war with you or went to war for you for 10 years. I took out baby a stein acts like what more do you want from me mm -hmm. and she's like oh so you're not gonna listen to me i guess we're i'm done with you like i don't want to have to deal with this i don't want to have to deal with you crying to me when you're losing like it's just this back and forth and yeah odysseus does tell her off too at a part of it i mean you can tell he regrets it by the end but <laughs> I, I like that because you could tell that he just, it was one of those things where he was mad or like emotional and he just like said it without like really thinking about what he was necessarily saying, but he wasn't lying. Yeah. Like that's one of my favorite things about this depiction of Athena is that it's the same as how Rick writes her. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny to me to remember some comments I've seen from people who are, what are they called? Hellenistic? Polytheists. Yeah, who are like, oh, I don't like how Rick wrote Athena. It was like misogynistic or whatever. And I'm like, no, this is just how Athena is. <laughs> like if, if you're the god of, like if you think you're really smart, like more smart than everyone else and you're obsessed with like strategy and you're so cold hearted that you just, think like this is just what you need to do to win and so you just do it to win and that's it like done deal.com nothing else matters this is the kind of stuff that you would do and mm -hmm. like I loved this song because he makes a really good point of like you're so smart but you're living your entire life alone yeah like why why are you living your entire life alone if you're this like sm the smartest like person being that exists in this world, why does nobody want to be around you if you're actually like that smart and that cool and and like always have the right answer? Yeah. And it's like 
because you're not. <laughs> And it, but it's also a thing of like, yeah, it's really easy to like judge the decisions that other people are making because it reminds me so much, this is like a sidebar, but it reminds me so much of um, BBC Sherlock of all things. But yeah. I loved that because that's how I figured out that I was asexual was that show by how Sherlock is. And one storyline they have in that show is him saying like caring is a disadvantage and him learning that that's not true. Because his older brother thinks that if you care about people, it makes you not as smart or you won't make as many like smart choices if you care about people because your feelings about them will like influence your decisions in a way that like disrupts what you would normally do or something. That's what this stuff reminds me of. And it's like, yeah, but like caring about people is literally the only reason to be alive. Yeah. Like, that's, that's literally it. Like, the entire point of life is to find people that you care about enough to want to spend time with them. The other stuff doesn't, like, and I, I liked these songs with Athena because I think it showed, like, a really good way of making that point of, like, yeah, like, he got away from Troy and he beat Polythemus, but does he really need to go back and like murder this Cyclops after he blinded him and stole all of his food? Uh -huh. And he's like alone on this island and he doesn't have any way to leave and he doesn't have any food or anything and no one's going to come help him. And like, does he really need to go back and kill him when he's already down? Like, is that really the thing that you would do if you want to prove that you're the best or like is that really the smartest thing to do is to do something like that to somebody when you've already beat them like you yeah. don't need you don't need to do that in order to show that you've won like that's usually what villains do like villains are the ones that usually go back even when the person's like laying on the ground and obviously in a lot of pain and they've won the fight they'll come back to like finish them off but because they don't care about what they're doing to another person like but you're not supposed to do that when you're the hero yeah and it, it's always like the fun of like greek mythology stories is this sort of stuff where like the gods especially athena is like no this is just how you win a battle and so you just should do this because i say so and it's like but i'm a human being and i don't want to do that <laughs> like i i care about other people and i don't want to do that because that feels like towing the line yeah. Of, of like going way too far over the edge of doing something that's like unforgivable and yeah. i that's what why odysseus is so interesting is because he like he likes athena and he mm -hmm. and he wants to make her happy but he's also not willing to like destroy who he is as a person or in, in order to make her happy and it's like fun to hear him finally like make a stand against her in this song and for her to be like fine i'm leaving <laughs> like really <laughs> dramatically and it's like okay bye <laughs> like thanks for your help i guess like i almost just got eaten by a cyclops and you showed up to tell me that i didn't kill him good enough and that's the only like input yeah. you've given me <laughs> And I mean, to an extent, like, was she probably right because of what Polyphemus does next? Yeah, but like, at the same time, I get where he was coming from because as we saw in this version, having to take out a Steinax took out a lot out of him. And he was questioning everything in that moment. It seems to be kind of the thing in here is he's questioning is having the God's favor worth it? which is something we see Percy grapple with a lot, you know, like doing what's, what is right for my fellow demigods versus what the Olympians want me to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's also like a thing with heroes that like people sometimes are like, oh, they should have, they should have just killed that person. Why didn't they go back and just do it? Like I can think of a million, like just off the top of my head, like I'm remembering how in like Lord of the Rings, Mm -hmm. um that frodo doesn't want to kill gollum yeah. because he he reminds him a little bit of himself and gollum ends up like tearing off a bunch of his fingers before he falls into the volcano but like they do whatever they can not to not to kill him even though sam is like can we just kill this person because i hate this person who's been manipulating you all this time um yeah. 
And there's a lot of other stories like that where like the hero could, I mean, Percy, like Percy could kill Polythemus. Clarice is having like a conniption fit on him for not killing Polythemus many different, at least four different times <laughs> at the end of Sea of Monsters when he doesn't want to do it. And so it's like, people are always like, the hero is like too weak, or they should have made the tough decision. And it's like, no, they're just being a good person. Like part of being a good person is that you don't kill people based on the potential of something they could do one day. Like yeah. you don't kill people because it's possible they might hurt you. You only hurt people if they're actually trying to hurt you. And like, yeah, maybe he could have gone back and killed Polythemus because he might come after him, but there's also the potential that he won't. Yeah. And so it's like, you are you shouldn't kill people based on things they haven't even done yet. Like, just as a, a like a rule. <laughs> but that's yeah. part of the whole thing with heroes is that's like the right thing to do. You should give people chances, even people that seem like they're monsters or whatever, before at least as many chances as they can before they just kill you like you shouldn't just take them out because you think they might do it like it's a very aggressive thing in book two of sea of monsters with tyson and i'm sure that that's where like this whole thing with polythemus is likely where um rick got that like um, motivation or whatever the word I'm th trying to think of right now is to have a character like tyson in the book about the odyssey Mm -hmm. is to try to humanize that person to show like you can't be sure who's good and who's bad if you're just judging them based on who you think they are and like really when it comes down to it like polythemus has every reason to hate them yes like they showed up on his island stole all of his food then tried to kill him and then like blind him so he can't even see anymore like yeah i would be really fucking angry at people who did that to me too <laughs> Yeah. And Odysseus doubles down when Athena's like, you should take him out by, um, that's how we see him doing the whole, you know, I'm Odysseus, I'm uh, king of Ithaca. And it's because he thinks like, no, that's not even necessary. And his speech to Polyphemus is, I want you to remember me and my crew next time that you, like, you essentially don't show mercy to somebody because um, that's what he sees as, you know, what could have gone differently, at least from uh, from Polyphemus's end was um, like, yeah, we came in a little hot and we're rude and took all your food and stuff. But like, had you shown us mercy, all of this wouldn't have needed to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, the last shot in that is just this really, like wicked smile on behalf of polyphemus once he hears his name because then he can actually curse him <laughs> oh man and i i will say though i know i think we talked about this when we were talking about the sea of monsters book mm -hmm. but i talking about this just makes me think about it again especially since thanksgiving is in like two weeks that the whole thing of like killing off a, a cyclops who is like the person that's living on the land that you're trying to take over, it just feels like a very aggressive, like anti indigenous thing <laughs> for yeah. them to describe the like people who live on this land as a scary cyclops that are really big and evil and stupid and eat people and eat people and will like go after you no matter how many times. And the whole idea of like, you need to go back and kill them for good. And I'm like, that's the original Thanksgiving story where they slaughtered an indigenous tribe that they told them that they would get along with them and then just kill them all and then celebrated by eating all their food. And so it just like, sounds very familiar to that. And I know that's part of like, the interesting part about these myths is that it's very white supremacy minded. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's that's part of like the interesting stuff when it comes to the Percy Jackson books because Rick talks about how the gods are like the western world and he talks about the problems with the western world and things like that through talking about how these gods act and how they treat people and things like that and the reactions that people have from them like their kids have towards them because of 
these other issues that are going on. Like, it's not like a funny, like, happenstance <laughs> that a lot of these kids are, like, abused kids that are basically in, like, foster care or are, like, left alone mm -hmm. and things like that. Like, like, that's just the most marginalized people in the world. So that's who these people are in these book series, too. But it's just interesting to think about the original myths that way, which I'm sure people don't like to think about that much. But, but like... When I say they, I mean like people who study this in school probably don't like to think about that because I feel like it might ruin the enjoyment of it. But I but I think it's more fun to think about it in that context to like enjoy these stories, but also like try to take something out of them in the way that we're aware of these things now to be like, actually, I'm not sure that it was the right thing to do to like just kill the Cyclops <laughs> or like like run in and just steal all of his food and just expect him to be fine with that. <laughs> and like, what did you think was gonna happen? Yeah, well, it's the way that the, the cyclopes are described is so much like those early endonographies of indigenous people where it's like, oh, they don't till the land, so they're not civilized. And it's like, okay, but you can tell they're agrarian because they have sheep that they regularly take out to pasture and then bring back inside. Um, they have like fruit, the, the island's abundant. Just because they're not working the island in a way that you recognize does not mean they're not working the island. Yeah, they're just doing it in a way that you haven't thought of yet. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they're like simple minded or primitive. It just means that you think you're really special. Like, oh no, they live in caves, okay. So it's like the whole thing of the whole them living in um mud huts thing that people would say, even mm -hmm. to this day, that's something that comes up, but like actually mud huts are like the longest running sort of structures there is. They can withstand a lot of like crazy weather. They like keep like heat away the best, which is why people use them. Mm -hmm. But because British people, <laughs> like saw them using it in Africa they just assumed that because it was not how they lived that it was like less than yeah somehow but it's like no they just use different things because they have a lot of mud and stuff like that where they live and it gets a lot harder where you live in an island where everything is rain mm -hmm. that's all it is guys <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's yeah I just I always think about that when we talk about polythemus and like cyclops especially mm -hmm. and i always really appreciate how rick riordan has an entire character who everyone adores to the ends of the earth and he's a cyclops yes and so it just makes you immediately the second look at all of them from that point forward being like but are you guys all like tyson yeah because i love tyson <laughs> Could you all be like Tyson if people didn't try to kill you from the time that you were born? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Like, I, I saw this cute little thing on Instagram the other day that was, like, comparing, like, the things that the, they're, like, things that the children of Poseidon ask for. And it was, like, Percy being, like, pay your child support. And Tyson mm -hmm. being, like, can I have a big stick? <laughs> but I, I just... I really love that Rick did that where he made like a quote unquote monster, his brother, and it makes you just love him. So you just love him so much mm -hmm. throughout that whole book and the rest of them going forward that it just has to humanize Polythemus when you one day run into him. I'm really interested to see how they do, how they show that on the show, because the show is very aggressive with the whole, not every monster is a monster. Like not every monster looks like a monster sort of story mm -hmm. already in season one and it just becomes more evident in season two yeah um but i i always just think about that whenever i hear anything about polythemus it's like yeah he was just a creature living on his island minding his own business and some people just showed up and stole all of his food and then tried to kill him and he was just expected to like take some wine and have some hallucinating like things on super strong wine and be fine with the fact that they did that to him and i'm like why would you think that anyone would be okay with that yeah <laughs> like exactly. of course he's gonna come after you and try to 
kill you if you blind him and steal all of his food. Yeah. Of course he's not going to want you to get home safely after that. Like, would you? <laughs> like, if somebody showed up and did that to you, would you be like, it's fine. You can leave on your ship now. I'm good. I'm, I'll, I'm sure I'll be fine, even though I have no food. Yeah. And I can't see anything, so I can't go find some more. I'm, I'm sure I'll be fine anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like another casting thing. It'll be so interesting when we get there to see who they cast as Polyphemus, because I do really enjoy, you know, the not like what you'd expect monsters to be like. I'm sure they'll go with somebody who's like big, strong man. I don't know why The Rock came to mind for me right now when I said that, but like that kind of physique is what I'm thinking, I guess. Yeah, uh, somebody like him physique-wise who is not him. Yeah. Because he's not a nice person. Uh, so I don't, I don't want him to be a Percy Jackson. <laughs> but another wrestler, like they already had um, Adam, they already had Adam Copeland play Ares, so they can find somebody else from that world and it's also interesting to think about because i don't know how they're gonna do it like on screen mm -hmm. um like maybe they'll do it like they're doing with daniel where they just have them act like normal and just put cyclops stuff over their face after filming is already over yeah um but it's also possible that they have like somebody be like his body and mm -hmm. then somebody else who could be like a more well-known person be like his voice or something like that if they don't want to do that yeah um, that's like an interesting cat especially because historically so far on this show they always cast people that are really right for the role and it's never who you think it is <laughs> like yes. it's never like the stereotypical person you would go for but then when i like look like when daniel was cast we were like he's almost 30 <laughs> like what's going on yes. and then we watched like the trailer for the half of it and we were like oh my god this person is perfect as tyson i could not imagine somebody else playing this part at this point and i haven't even seen him actually do it yet um but i still like can't imagine somebody else who could have possibly been better than him after seeing him act in that movie that's very much what you need is to play something like tyson and so I'm sure that whoever it is is Polythemus is probably going to be somebody that people know of, but also is like, I never would have pictured him as the person that, that was going to play this Cyclops, but also at the same time, that sounds like a fun idea. <laughs> yeah. It's going to probably be something like that. Yeah, so um, when do we think that casting announcement would come out? Uh, it's hard to say because the scenes that will be like indoors for mm -hmm. Polythema stuff, which on like sets and stuff, which is most of the scenes at this point, wouldn't happen until like the very end. And so yeah, they can stretch it out because he's in some of the nightmares, but mm -hmm. and like, it's also the thing too with the show is it's always possible that they like switch around the order of things because uh -huh. they switched some things a little bit with the first season as well and uh -huh. so it's possible that they do that they have poly like they could do like the polythemus stuff and then like or introduce him earlier on than uh -huh. normal or than they did in the books anyway but it's also a thing of like it probably wouldn't be the very last episode because the very last episode will be when Luke almost like murders them all mm -hmm. and and whatever happens with that. And so and then like going back to camp and like Thalia waking up and and Tyson going to see Poseidon and, and all that kind of stuff. And so it might be like the very beginning of the last episode in the same way that like the fight with Ares was the very beginning of the last episode of the first season. But most of that is probably going to be episode seven. And so it probably would be like around Christmas time or like January sometime yeah. that they would probably be filming that stuff. And so they might tell us who is cast as him around the holidays somewhere. Like I feel like around holiday time, especially because they announced Thalia on like a random Monday, 
<laughs> there was like no reason <laughs> just like rick just did an interview and disney and he was like can i say this and disney was like sure and he was like oh okay <laughs> so i feel like it's going to be something like that like sometime around thanksgiving or something that one of them will do an interview somewhere like rick will do an interview or something or other and or like the percy account would just all of a sudden out of nowhere just be like oh this person's playing playing polythemus and this person's playing cersei and everyone will be like okay thanks <laughs> like you do it at the most random time but that makes it kind of fun <laughs> yeah it might be a little bit more like so tantalus was not during a specific event if i remember correctly mm -mm. that was just kind of dropped a couple weeks after the gray sisters were announced mm -hmm. Yeah, so it might be something similar to that where it's just like, yeah, so this is the person we chose. It's like, all right, that sounds good. Yep. Whenever they, f I feel like they do that stuff whenever they get to the episode where that person's filming mm -hmm. and they feel like it might like get out that that person is on their show somehow, they just say it before anyone even notices. <laughs> yeah. And like, that's fine. It's like, it's honestly fun to just like randomly log into Instagram on a random day and all of a sudden for them to be like, oh, this person's going to be on the show and, and us sitting there like, oh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't expect that. I think it's almost kind of funny that they don't, um, that they don't do as many like big reveals for like the big events. They do like the big reveals around the big events a lot of the time, mm -hmm. but they don't do it like, because that's annoying. <laughs> Um, how people just assume like, oh, if they're going to this convention, then they're just going to tell everyone about it there. Um, but instead, they just kind of tell everybody about it right before or right after. Mm -hmm. It's more fun that way because then everybody gets to find out at the same time. Yeah. And when you go to like a convention and they tell you there, the people of the audience find out first and it's always delayed for everyone else to know. Yeah, but like when... you might get someone live tweeting from the event. Yeah, but when it's like their Instagram just like that, the, when they were, I was trying to figure out when their D23 panel was happening, and then you sent me like the reel of them announcing that they cast Athena, and I was like, oh, I guess it's happening right now. Yes. <laughs> and so, but it's like, it's much more fun that way that everyone gets to find out all at the same time. And yeah. so it's, I don't even want to like take a guess about who they would pick because I would never be right about something like that. But I do think it will be relatively soon that they say some of those parts like Cersei and and things like that, because they're going to be getting to those episodes um, next, because if they if like Walker said, they're filming the the Scylla and, and Cryptus like Cryptus stuff. And so that's the next episode is when they end up going to if they go in like the chronological order of the books and they don't like move anything around cersei's okay. island would be the next thing they do and yeah. then the sirens where everyone thinks it's romantic that um annabeth almost drowns her in percy and then tells him that she would join luke's side <laughs> yeah so <laughs> that will be happening soon and so um it's always interesting to think about what they could change or whatever too. Like that's part of the fun of this show is like, I know what they did last time, they changed some things around. And so it's possible that everything will be completely different. Mm -hmm. And none of what I just said will be accurate. <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> With Cersei though, that would go on for more than just this book though, right? Like, cause there's other Cersei related things that happen in the series. Mm -mm. No, it's just this book. Oh, it's is it Calypso's island that it, no, like no Calypso. Someone who was on Cersei's island for a while, serving Reyna. Is that yeah? There? Yeah, Reyna is somebody that is like there in the background. She doesn't come in for a really long time though, but they don't really talk about Cersei besides Percy and Annabeth just realizing that she was there when they were there mm -hmm. um but that's pretty much it and but they don't really run into her again um yeah. and i will say that calypso is on her own special island yeah <laughs> in percy jackson nobody else is like 
there. Like, she doesn't interact with Cersei or, or anyone else for that matter. Um, she's just there being a little manipulative person <laughs> on her on her own. There's, like, special grudges with, um, with Calypso in Percy Jackson. Not out, even outside of what I usually say about her, but because of who she's related to. Mm -hmm. I get, people get very, like, even more annoyed with her because of who she's related to. And I'm like, the other person was so much better than you. <laughs> Why are you the one that gets to still be alive? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so that's, that's like a very different thing in these books. They never really run into her again. They just know that she's out there somewhere, probably still turning men into hamsters. <laughs> <laughs> but they never run into her again. Yeah, but we should be getting a big makeover scene from Annabeth. And I know mm -hmm. Becky was tweeting out something about shampoo today. Oh uh, my god. Okay, I so I have blocked people on on TikTok that hyper fixate on the tiniest little details and act like Rick Riordan like doesn't remember anything about his books and he doesn't remember any details and he's just so stupid when he's writing these books that he makes all of these continuity mistakes because they greatly annoy me and this was a really good example and it made me laugh this morning waking up and seeing Becky just like really fucking annoyed <laughs> and like she even said in the tweet like she said something about like, oh, I'm not, I'm not in a good mood today. I'm in like a sassy mood or something like that. And basically somebody must have been complaining enough for them to see it or for her to see it at least that because in the late, the latest book, Annabeth says like her shampoo is like apple scented instead of like lemon scented, like, like it is in like the fourth book um she was like making this tweet being like does anyone know if there's any freaking shampoo <laughs> that is like lemon scented that works for like the right you know like curl pattern and afro like hair for annabeth because and it was like this whole and she went back and forth with like a black like fan like that gave her recommendation but she was very obviously extremely annoyed like that thing ended with her saying the like she put up like the emoji for lemon, like the lemon Percy Jackson fans. Thank you. Oh my and god. I was just like, oh my god, who, who has been talking about how Annabeth shampoo like changed in a matter of like many years enough that real life Annabeth is like, you know what? I'll find <laughs> I'll find a lemon like shampoo. So then the next book we will go back to that, and you guys will leave us alone about this. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, somebody had to. I don't know who it is. Somebody did, and they should probably calm down. <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't matter. Do you really, like, how many times do we have to make the point that Becky is Annabeth? Do you really want to piss off Annabeth? <laughs> like, she will, she will, like, say things to you, and you won't even know that she's insulting you. Yeah. And she will be insulting you. Do you really want to have that experience on threads right now? Because you could, I guess, but I don't I don't know why you want to, but it's it's just a ridiculous do you know how many times I change shampoos? Yes. Like maybe maybe this is just a, a very poor person thing, but I just buy whatever shampoo is like affordable for me. Mm -hmm. that I think will work for my hair so that I don't have to take a shower that many times a week because I hate taking showers. Um, so that's it. That's all I care about. And I'm like, oh, that, that shampoo is like $10 and it's on sale and it says that it's hydrating. That means I can get away with only taking like two showers a week. Okay, I'll buy that. I don't care what kind it is. <laughs> I don't make enough money to like be able to buy like nice brands or anything like that. And so this feels like a, an incredibly petty thing to be worried about right now. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's like Annabeth shampoo changing. I'm like, can everyone stop being weird? <laughs> yeah, calm down. It's okay. <laughs> but like, it's really fine. It, this is the stuff that annoys the shit out of me about, um, fandom things that ever since the stupid cinema sins, 
YouTube channel became big whenever that was. I hate them so much because they're like this channel that would like review movies and their way of reviewing movies would basically be mad that they were movies. They would be like, oh, bombs fall in space in Star Wars when there isn't gravity. And it's like it's in a galaxy far, far away. So there is no science that works in our world in this world because it's not in our world. It's in a different galaxy. And number two, it's a movie. If you're watching these battles and you're like, that wouldn't happen in real life, you're not enjoying the movie. And you should probably work on enjoying it. You're supposed to like forget about that stuff and be invested in the characters and not be sitting there being a pedantic little jerk. (laughs) And so that's what this stuff reminds me of, of people picking apart these little details and finding something wrong with them. And it's like, oh my God, I'm glad that Becky is that person that's like, can somebody give me the shampoo so nobody can sit there and say that we like messed up something with Annabeth ever again <laughs> for like the last book <laughs> in this like new trilogy that they're doing? Yeah, people still just want to be hung up on the fact that Leo is playing Annabeth. That's what it really comes down to. Mm-hmm. And Rick has more than proven that she is his headcanon Annabeth at this point. Like. The two of them at D23 Brazil were so cute. You can find yeah. videos of them just like doing the same mannerisms and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's very, very adorable. Yeah. And he's said a million times that she is his Annabeth, that she is more like Annabeth, where he understands the character better now because of watching her play the part. And, and mm-hmm. like, I guess part of it is like, fandoms can get so like weirdly myopic about these little details and kind of take things in the worst possible way and so the idea is like oh rick forgot like this detail about annabeth's shampoo or whatever in the years and it's like no they just switched what kind of shampoo she used because she's played by a black actress now and they couldn't find one that would work on black hair that was scented that way and so they just changed what scent she wore yeah that's literally all it was and so um becky was asking about that today to find a replacement since people notice that and it's like if you take it the worst possible way every time Mm -hmm. and you're always going to be like disappointed you're always just going to think that they don't care about this story but i guarantee you that they think a lot more about this stuff than even you do yeah and just like give them time or like just look at them as people instead of being like you changed this one small detail and i'm gonna do a whole podcast episode about it (laughs) or like youtube video about it or something like as much as rick has done a lot of work you know since percy jackson there's been multiple percy jackson series he branched out into egyptian mythology he branched out into norse mythology yes we all know these things But he's not like, I want to say someone like Dean Koontz, where you see his name on everything, or even Stephen King, like where they write so much, you have to wonder how much they're invested in each piece of media they put out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and honestly, I know that people talk about like the timeline in Percy Jackson and how it doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. And like, I cannot emphasize enough. I do not care. Yeah. Like, I don't care. All I care about is like how old Percy says he is. Mm-hmm. And, and that's that's literally it. I don't like I don't care because it's just like there's so many other things in the story going on that matter that the last thing that I care about is like timeline issues because I don't need it. I don't need the timeline to like fit up exactly right in order to enjoy the story because the story exists outside of that. And that's just something that I've never understood like Usually, usually when I, when I start noticing little details about things like that, about something, it means that I don't like it anymore. Mm -hmm. Because when I really enjoy it and I am into the story and the characters, that's the only thing that I care about. And so if I start noticing little details like that, that don't match up, it means that the characters aren't like acting like themselves enough where I start to notice the little things that I usually don't notice or just don't care about when I'm invested in the story. And so it's, I know that some people are just analytical like that, but it just never makes sense to me how you can like enjoy something, but also 
spend all your time like noticing all the little things that don't match up because it's like but who cares when all these other things are going on that are much more interesting i just don't care yeah that was everything i had notes on was there anything we didn't cover yet um the only thing i can think of is rick did say in that one interview where he was talking a lot about the kids and protecting them he also said that the new book the last book of his trilogy that he's doing right now of percy getting letters of recommendation mm -hmm. the thing he said about the last book of that trilogy is that he hasn't written it yet and yeah. that he said that a character that hasn't been seen in a long time will come back and like scare percy mm -hmm. um by him by him like being there again and i'm like terrified that it's gonna be luke because they foreshadow in the second book that hermes is gonna be the one for the third book mm -hmm. and i'm like jesus christ <laughs> i'm like afraid that luke is somehow gonna come back or interact with him somehow or something will be involving him if it is because if it is talking about him going to college and like getting past this time of his life and talking to Hermes at all again, that's how does that not come up? Yeah, because Luke was about college aged when like everything started happening. Yeah, and it's just and Luke was Hermes kid and that was the most that Percy interacted with Hermes was when Luke was around mm -hmm. and, and Hermes, Hermes thought he could somehow save him. Yeah. And so it just makes me wonder about that, especially because Percy in those books is very traumatized. Like mm -hmm. a friend of mine keeps sending me clips from when they're reading um, the first book, Chalice of the Gods. And it, it's so funny, even more now that people thought that Rick couldn't write like trauma or PTSD because he's literally like doing active PTSD symptoms that I have done. Like that friend sent me a clip of from Chalice of the Gods where he's trying to, he's supposed to be studying, like looking up stuff about Ganymede in that book, because that's the person he's trying to help in that book in the library, but he is depersonalization in. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say that as a, as like a verb, but, um, but that's basically for people who don't know that depersonalization is like a more heavy duty kind of dissociation where you see yourself outside of your own body and or you feel like somebody else is like telling you what to say like you feel like you're not saying the words that are coming out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. You feel like you're living in a TV show or a movie you don't feel like your life is real. Um, I did that up until like four years ago, like I used to when I used to go to work at like any job I ever worked at I would like see myself. Like I would be like above myself and I would see like the top of my head when I was walking. People at work would ask me questions and I would start saying things and I would have absolutely no idea where that was coming from. It felt like somebody else was telling me that. Like I felt like I was living in like a movie or like a TV show, nothing, even like the most, part of the stuff was like the most traumatic memories I have that made it hard for me to believe that they were real is that I saw them from like the outside, like I saw me, like mm -hmm. I saw me as if I was watching me. And so it, it was almost like I was in a TV show and a camera was on me and I was seeing like that version of me. And so I felt like I was like, these can't be real. These have to be dreams because how am I looking at myself? Mm -hmm. um, but that's a very common thing to happen when you've been severely traumatized is you do things like that. And so in this book, he's doing that. And so it's honestly kind of concerning to imagine a Percy that's doing depersonalization and derealization and, and like crying over trying to save a puppy and in the next book and having like actual like dissociation where he's like, where his hands are like shaking and his hands are and his feet are going numb, which is something that I've also had happen when I dissociate a lot. And where he's like getting upset at Grover and doesn't even remember how he ended up like grabbing a shirt and things like that. Like that version of Percy having to interact with Luke is like scary. 
like yeah. how he would respond to that because he wouldn't be able to hide as well how terrified he is of him yeah <laughs> and i i generally hope that it's not luke but I feel like it might be and like it would be kind of worth it if it goes how I would want it to like Percy having a chance to like say out loud like how horrible he hurt him mm -hmm. because he never really had the chance to really do that because in the books he was you know kidnapped four months after Luke was killed or Luke yeah. died and so he never really had the chance to really realize how bad the stuff he did was and actually like say it out loud to someone. And so if he gets to do that, it would be worth it, especially if Hermes has to sit there and watch it. <laughs> Just yeah. to, like, make him feel bad about realizing the stuff that his son actually did. Um, it could not be even Hermes that's in the last book. It could be somebody else. Um, but if it is, that would be quite interesting, especially because it's been really interesting to watch the fandom slowly like Luke more and more because Charlie Bushnell is attractive. Yeah. And so that would definitely disrupt that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I hope Rick would knock him down a peg or two. Like, Charlie he is would. doing a great job. I will say that. But yeah, we need to recontextualize how bad Luke is. And I don't know, maybe some of the flashbacks will do that, will serve that purpose of like, well, he had this much trust from Annabeth and stuff, and he just let that go. Mm -hmm. Plus the betrayal I, of he hurt Talia. I will say that I know that that it's kind of, I don't mean to sound like egotistical when I say this, but I know that Rick agrees with how we talk about him mm -hmm. because of things that he said. And it, like uh, an inner, like, I don't know what to call it. It wasn't like an interview, but it was when he would be on goods reads in the past like back in like the early 2010s and people would ask him questions on there and then he would respond and one of those times somebody asked like do you think that luke was ever like redeemed or anything like that or yeah basically that sort of idea like do you think he could he was ever like redeemed or saved and he basically said like i hope that he is like in his next life if he gets that and he's like but he basically said like it's really sad whenever you see somebody that has a lot of opportunities to change what they're doing but they never take any of them mm -hmm. and you just hope that after they die and they realize what they did that the next time they go through life that they'll change how they act and not make the same decisions and i was mm -hmm. like yeah thank you sir that's exactly what we would say that's exactly what i would say Mm -hmm. I say that about my own abusive, horrible dad is like, yeah, he had a million chances to not make the decisions he did, but he did in the same way that like Luke had a lot of chances to change his mind, but he also didn't do that. Yeah. And so he's not when he's saying that he's not saying like, oh, uh, Luke was redeemed by killing himself at the end of the book. He's saying like, no, he was never redeemed in the books that I wrote there's just the chance of hoping that one day he will like not do that again. Um, that's the only thing you can hope for. And but... maybe that is why Rick placed him at, you know, like the Isle of the Blessed instead of <laughs> somewhere else is because I de I mean, if you go there, you can drink from the river Lethe and have a second life. Yeah. Oh. And I, and honestly, when it comes to like the world that the Greek God world, like Hermes was, running interference for Luke for a long time. Hermes is one of the best known gods. He would use whatever favors he could get to get him in there, even if he shouldn't be there. And like, as fans, we can think that Luke got knocked down to other places in in the afterlife at, at a certain point too, because mm -hmm. it is very upsetting to think about him being in the same place as his victims. Yeah. Um, especially a lot of the victims that, that were killed by him or because of him in the last book um, for them to show up right after he killed them and only for him to be there with them in the mm -hmm. afterlife too. And so it's one of those things of Hermes thinks that that's where Luke is, but they could have just lied to him and just told him that so that he would leave them alone because, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that Luke would never get a chance, his like spirit, his soul would never get a chance to like 
redo things but when you mess up life that bad you should have to go in a timeout for a while yeah so like really understand how bad you messed up your life and how many people you actually hurt before you get to try again Mm -hmm. and that's like how i kind of see that stuff and that's why i say like i feel okay with us saying stuff about him even though people get upset with us about it because i'm like i know that the creators of these things agree with me because i've literally read them agreeing with me (laughs) so i'm fine with that i'm fine if you're if you're mad at me because i know that they that's how they see him too and they're the ones in charge of everything and so at a certain point that interpretation of luke is gonna hit people in the face on the tv show and and then they're just gonna have to deal with it then like we can do our best to try to warn them before it gets to that point but Mm -hmm. if they don't want to listen then the tv show is just gonna make it like extremely abundantly obvious and there's it's gonna be a lot harder to even if charlie is an attractive young man (laughs) It's going to be a lot harder to like sit there and watch him, especially in the next season, like have the flashbacks with Thalia and Annabeth and then show up trying to kill all of them. Mm -hmm. That's going to be very hard to for people to be like, oh, but Luke is still a victim (laughs) or like Luke is a revolution. Like the thing about that one article I thought was really interesting about Charlie saying that about how he thinks that Luke is a revolutionary person is he said i think this is who luke is and i'm like oh so other people don't agree with you Mm -hmm. like now i run and know who doesn't that's so interesting to think about (laughs) about just among like the cast like what do the other cast members think of luke yeah (laughs) yeah because we know they all read and they're all fans yeah and they and like of course charlie's playing him so he's gonna think that he's playing like the radical revolutionary that goes against the grain and wants to save the world but i have a feeling like some of the other characters would have different (laughs) interpretations of him than that and it's just fun to imagine them talking about this stuff when they're filming on set yeah yeah they'll have a lot of talks about that between takes (laughs) just it's a regular this time and especially Um, like with the with their acting coach yeah yeah, I, I'm sure it feeds into their characters a little bit too, how they feel about all these things. Yeah, and especially like if other if the other actors listen to Percy Jackson podcasts like Charlie does, it would be really interesting to see if they listen to ones that have conflicting opinions. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, which one do they decide to listen to? Because yeah. we don't all agree. Yeah, well, I will say Walker has been pretty insightful when we see him actually like talking about the books. I always say this, but I wish that somebody would just let him talk about the books. Like outside of him being Percy, who cares about that? Just let him talk about the books as like a fan of it and not talk about filming or acting or anything at all. Just let him nerd out about this thing that he loves a lot. Like he's only 15 and he's read the book seven times already. Um, just let him talk about it. He's one of us. <laughs> yeah. And he would have a lot of really interesting things to say. I would I would always want to talk about to him about how we both thought that Annabeth was the mole. Mm-hmm. And how most people are like, are you crazy? And I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> but now I feel like I can be like, well, he agrees with me. So I'm not as crazy as I thought I was, was I? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's just... But that stuff would be really interesting to ever listen to. I don't know if anyone would ever give him that chance, um, but it'd be fun if we get it one day. Yeah, maybe someday. Maybe once they've done more of the TV show, we'll just get it bit by bit. Especially, I feel like when they're getting ready for Titan's Curse, oh anytime he does an interview, it's just going to turn into that of him talking about all the things that Percy goes through. Like, it's overwhelming for me to imagine him getting ready for playing that role. Mm-hmm. because there's just so so much to try to understand that's a heavy it's going to be a very heavy season yeah and it's just percy is just going through everything all at once and so there's so much to try to understand before you can possibly act it out in a scene yeah okay so i just heard the boys got home so i gotta get william to bed um william's been doing 
these like local chess tournament things <laughs> um and it's like usually mostly older people because they meet at breweries and stuff but jake's been just like taking him and the past time there was another kid there um but yeah like it really tests him because william mostly plays online so he gets to play with live people now you're not really an autistic child if you don't have a hobby that everyone else who does it is an adult. <laughs> yeah.